and discursive session on policy and is it possible to make generative AI academic policy fit for purpose? Dr. Claire Ellison is our host for today and Claire is by no means the end of the policy road. So if there's any issues, you know, don't direct them directly to Claire. We're going to talk about the policy, talk through it nicely, and Claire's going to give us a brilliant presentation and host the discussion. So we are recording. We'll share the recording with everyone, as we've said throughout the week. And Claire, I will get out of your way. I'll keep an eye on questions in the chat. If you want to pop them in, Claire can see them. And if they're not spotted, I'll pick them up, you know, at some point. So thank you, Claire. Over to you. Thanks, Rob, and, and thanks for everything you've done this week. I've been able to attend sessions earlier in the week as well, and it's been it's been really good and, and kind of discussions going on. It's been great, and I kind of want to carry that on through this session. So, yeah, I'm going to be presenting a little bit about the policy, but no one really wants to sit here on a Thursday lunchtime and hear me talk about policy too much. So I do want it to be more discussion about the policy and, and thinking about it a bit sort of further back a bit sort of what is the policy for why have we even got policy that kind of thing so yeah it's not going to be um too dry i hope and, and keep you all entertained this thursday lunch time so what i'm going to briefly do is just talk about uh our, our, when i say our through this talk i'm meaning the university of liverpool as a general institution mainly led by us at cie so our response to Gen AI, Gen AI sorry, over the last 18 months and where that kind of came from. And then a very brief description of the current policy and guidance that we have. Um, I'm going to talk about the uh, surveys that we ran at the start of this year that looked at both the staff and student opinions on um, those guidance documents and those policy changes that we've done um, to try and see if, if any more changes were required. So I'm going to talk through that as well. And then come into, as I said, more discussion about the bigger problems around um, policy for generative AI and policing generative AI. And what we need to do moving forward, not just from our point in CIE in terms of these, these guidance documents, but also in terms of us as an institution, as a higher educational establishment, what direction is all of this going in? Um, as I've said, I do want this to be quite a discursive um, session, so I've set up a, a Padlet and I'll paste the link to it in the chat as well. Um, and within that Padlet, there are sections where you can at any point, if you've got any comments on any specific thing, please just put them in there. And then I've also got some specific questions that I will come to at specific points in the presentation. So feel free to answer those now if you've got an opinion on them now, but I will come to those at specific uh, points in time. Okay. All right. So hopefully you're all here in the right place and you're all expecting a, a talk on policy. Um, and if not, Feel free to log off right now. I won't be offended. All right, then. So starting off, where did this all begin? Well, I kind of pinpoint the start of all of this back to the 18 months ago, coming up to two years ago now, really. I need to update this slide. Um, and you, this graph I really like using because it really points it out so clearly. So this is um, internet searches for ChatGPT and time going across the bottom. And you see here it is a dead zero up until November 2022 and then it just skyrockets and has continued to be ever prevalent ever since and it's the same with twitter or x as we should say um tweets per day on that topic again going from absolute zero two years ago to really really high now and almost a ubiquitous tool you say chat gpt you'll be hard pushed to now find someone who doesn't know what that is but I think it's important to to know, and, and I think everyone gets this now, and especially everyone attending the talks this week and everyone who's, who's been engaged in these sessions, is that we are talking about more than ChatGPT now. So obviously we've got Google Gemini and Microsoft Copilot. Uh, you know, they're becoming the biggest players in the game. They've got the corporate branding behind them. And they've also got the ability to integrate into everything we use. Um, I myself, when I'm at work, I tend to use a lot of Microsoft products because obviously, you know, we've got all the Microsoft licenses. However, when I'm at home, I'm very much a Google person. So I, I use Chrome or my accounts are with Google. But between these two, essentially everything I use when it comes to computers now has some sort of integrated generative AI in it. I don't know if anyone else is experiencing this, experiencing this, I'm sure you are, but you, any task that you try and do, it's like, oh, there's an AI to help you with that. You'll get a little box coming up going, oh, do you want AI to write that for you? Even writing Word documents, it's guessing the next word that you're writing, it's just typing. It is 
everywhere. And it is no longer necessarily a conscious decision that we're making to transfer a task into an AI world. We say, oh, I don't, I don't want to use, I want to use AI to do this task for me, so I'm going to go to ChatGPT to do it. That is still happening in some instances. But in other instances, we're just doing things the way we've always done them, and AI is popping up to help us without us really making that conscious decision. And it's very easy for us to click and go, yeah, okay, help me with this. And I'm not just talking us here as staff, as academics, I'm talking students, okay? So students are using the same tools that we are, you know, when they're writing their essays in Word or Google Docs, these tools are gonna to be prevent presenting themselves to them all the time as they're trying to work. And the way that this links into policy and what we're gonna talk about in a minute is that this raises some really important issues in that educational context and in that policy context. So the first one being, will students always be aware, you know, really, really aware of when and when they are not using generative AI? And this is already cropping up in, in a sort of gray air with the assistive technologies we use. I think everyone's probably aware of Grammarly and the sort of two T system Grammarly now operates in where you've got kind of your standard version where it does what it's always done and just checks spelling and grammar. Whereas there is also now the generative AI version. Um, the line between that generative AI and other assistive technologies becoming quite blurred. Um, and assistive technology developers know that if they can integrate generative AI tools, it makes their systems better. So they're going to start pulling in more and more and more of that technology. And the, the idea that you can have assistive technologies that don't use generative AI, I think, is, is going to just not happen anymore. Um, and it, we also have to remember that students will have access to and generally be expected to use generative AI as part of either their existing or future employment. So any students that are working with us sort of part-time, sort of professional students, chances are, depending on their role, it's an expectation of that, that they'll be using generative AI to help them with their work. So then for them to come into university and they say, oh, no, you can't use it for those tasks that you use it for in the real world, you can see how much of a confusing position that would put a student in. Um, and even if they're not using it right now, you know, they're not in employment right now, the world of work that they're going to go into other people will be using it. So for them to come in as a complete novice is really not going to be acceptable. Um, we need to be training up students to, to understand these tools and use these tools um, productively. So where does all of this leave us? Well, it, it left us with a, with a big cry for help. <laughs> Staff appreciated those questions and, and they understood uh, the need for, for students to be engaging with generative AI in a productive way. And, it was brand new to everybody. Nobody really knew how to get to grips with it. And I think it's only really over the past six months, people have felt a little bit more confidence with it and, and have kind of solidified in their mind their own thoughts on it and their own perspectives and, and feel confident enough to start really engaging well with it with students. But in terms of us at CIE, what we did, well, we tried to help staff um, as much as we could. We held lots of workshops. Um, over, so I'm thinking over 2023, um, held lots of workshops, lots of engagement with staff, and we produced a lot of documentation that's still all there on, on our website. Um, so if anyone hasn't been to this section of our website, I'm sure everyone has, but this is this is where to go to find everything up to date in terms of documentation related to generative AI. Okay? And in terms of how we reacted Compared to other institutions, I've found some uh, a study recently that shows that we can actually, with the, what we've done isn't unusual. Um, so I'm going to talk about the details of our policy in a moment. But essentially, um, um, Nick McDonald and colleagues earlier this year um, did an extensive review of uh, documentation. This was specifically for American, so uh, USA higher education institutions. But essentially, they looked through every possible um, website that they could get access to and that they could find their documentation related to generative AI use. And they established whether the um, institution was either uh, encouraging or discouraging use of generative AI and then rated how extensive their guidance was. And what they found, as you can see on the graph here, is that um, the majority of institutions were encouraging use, but with extensive guidance. So it's, yes, we appreciate that students need to be taught how to use generative AI. It's an important thing. We can't ignore it. However, that needs to be done um, with guidance. 
Altern um, sort of alternatively, there were institutions who are producing extensive guidance to discourage use and say, you know, this is not appropriate for your studies. It's not a reliable source. You shouldn't be using this, et cetera, et cetera. And really coming down on that stance of it. And then we've got other institutions who are actually producing very minimal guidance and some who are really sitting on the fence and are neither encouraging or discouraging and, and you know, not really saying much about it at all. And then that leaves kind of a really big hole for students to fall into and, and can potentially lead to, to problems. So it's I think it's good that we're up here with the majority, or the majority from this study anyway, who are producing guidance and, and trying to guide people in how to use it, but also encouraging use um, in appropriate ways. In addition to this, um, Rob actually pointed this out to me earlier today. Uh, this document here um, is a collection of policy statements from um, different institutions. And I will uh, pop that in the chat for you. I think I've got it. Yeah. Um, and it, it's a really interesting document because it just shows the range of responses from institutions. So some institutions have gone really in depth and, and they're quite lengthy in their explanations of, of why their approach in Gen AI and the way they are and making this really clear to students. Others, it's literally two sentences. <laughs> so it is it is really quite varied, the response out there at the moment. and and. University of Liverpool is essentially sitting in, in sort of the more guidancey um, side of that sphere. Okay, now I have the first um, of the questions that I put on the, the Padlet. So if you didn't go to the Padlet before, please go go there now. And this, this is kind of a bit of a, yeah, an awkward question. Um, just simply, do we have, we as in University of Liverpool, a Gen AI policy? I'll bring up the comment and then we can see the responses that come in. Claire, just while you're doing that, your sound is fine, but I think you might be on your webcam mic. I don't know if you want to switch it to your headset. Thank you so much, Ross. Is that a little better? Yeah, it's clearer. I just, okay. It's a bit quieter, but if I turn, if everyone turns you up, you're, you're clearer there. <laughs> right. It was fine before, it just sort of goes in and out a tiny bit. Ah, okay, we'll try, we'll try that now. Thank you, Rob. Okay, I'll bring the puzzle back up. Okay. It's only four votes so far, unless I need to refresh this. To refresh it. Okay, Rich, I like that question. Is it policy or guidelines? This is something that I'm going to clarify in a moment. But yeah, I want to kind of throw the question out there um, and just see what, what we got. Question again. Okay. So we've got majority of people saying, yes, um, we have a generative AI policy. OK, I'm going to be really picky here now. OK, we don't technically have a Gen AI policy. OK, we do not have a policy on Gen AI. What we do have is the academic integrity policy, which is COPRA Appendix L, and that discusses generative AI in the terms of academic misconduct. OK, so we don't technically have a policy on Gen AI. We have the academic integrity policy that mentions generative AI. And what um, that policy states is that generative AI use is permitted. And sort of, you know, we've taken the stance that, you know, we can't ban students from using it outright. So it is permitted as long as. And then there are, there are some caveats to that. So that being that they cite their use of generative AI, so why they've used it and what output they've got from it. Um, it's not their only source of information because it's not a reliable academic source. Um, yes, it can point you in the right direction and give you ideas, but it shouldn't be the, the end of the road in terms of your, your research journey. And that it does not materially add to the content of the assessment. So essentially, we're saying that students can't pass off writing 
that has been done by a generative AI system as their own. And that is, you know, basic academic integrity. You know, students should not be submitting work done by anybody else or any machine as their own. It's the key key principle of that. So the specifics of what the policy actually says, there are several mentions to um, artificial intelligence throughout in terms of, you know, a, a type of, of um, in a, you know, of, of how it might lead to a, a category A, B, C, D, whatever. But the specific bit that really focuses on artificial intelligence is this 2.5, and it is that dishonest practice with artificial artificial intelligence occurs when students try to pass off work um, or, or text or drawings, whatever it was generated by the artificial intelligence system as their own. Okay, so that's what the policy actually says so the policy as i said isn't a gen ai policy it's the academic integrity policy however what we do have are the guidelines that specifically relate to acad um, generative artificial intelligence use and these are the ones referred to here in the document as the um, guidance on acceptable and unacceptable uses okay so those um, guidance documents are part of the suite of things i said that were available from cie so the um, university guidance is available. So this link, the academic, academic integrity process is a newer document, and I'll talk about that one in a moment. But coming into that guidance of um, acceptable and unacceptable uses. So we initially um, made this document, I think it was, was it this time last year, the first version got released. I think it was for the start of last um, academic year. And then it was updated again um, for semester two because of certain things that we, we'd missed or, or certain clarifications that were required. So the initial document very much focused on just the acceptable and unacceptable uses. The updated version brought in um, more sort of wider issues such as uh, copyright um, and other issues like that about thinking about what you're putting into the system as well as what you're getting out and thinking about it more than just general like really specific student use cases so it's a more comprehensive document than it was hence why it's now called use a uh, guidance on the use of generative artificial intelligence rather than the the just acceptable unacceptable that it was the second guidance document there um, actually came out relatively recently and that has been produced um in response to the fact that the um, Turnitin generative AI detector was turned off this summer. And we got requests that if, if that was going to happen, and we knew it was going to happen, that staff, staff are going to need more guidance on how they actually deal with cases where they think um, students have used generative AI inappropriately. Um, so that, that document there was produced. So if anyone has got any comments on either of those documents or any thoughts that they want to share with the group, please feel free now. As I said, there is also space on the on the Padlet for these. So if you've got any comments on either the um, academic integrity policy or any of the guidance documents that I've spoken about, uh, please share. Um, um, the reason that I set this up as a Padlet rather than just using the chat is because I wanted more of a not a permanent record, obviously it's not permanent, but you know, I want something that I could refer to after the meeting because we really do want to take as much feedback as we can here at CIE to make these things as, as useful as possible. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the work we've done on that in a moment. So I'm just looking at the, the comment here. So it would be good to make uh, clear to students if they can use Gen AI to plan their say, for example, and if they can use Gen AI to rephrase their own work to make it sound better. I completely agree with that statement that that is something students need clear guidance on. However, it's something I think that can't be central. We can't centrally make that decision for every assessment that students are going to do. That needs to be on a much more context and departmental basis, um, depending on what you're assessing in your in your assessments. If if you think it is a key skill um, that students need to be able to plan an essay on their own, then we essentially can't say, you know, oh no, you should be letting students use that, use tools to do that. That's your academic core. So it's really hard for us as a central team to try and come up with guidance that's useful, but also applicable to all the different scenarios that people people um, come into contact with with their students or, or the different contexts of all the different assessments. Um, so next one that's just come in, is there any guidance 
on educators feeding students work into general how to assess whether or not it's been generated are you around the ethics of feeding large right okay so if i've understood that correctly um that is staff taking students work and then putting that into a generative ai to say was this written by gen ai okay there are two problems with that. One is slightly bigger than the other. The first problem with it is you as the marker, as the academic member of staff, don't own that work. So therefore you are not able to do that. You can't take student work and put it into um, any of these models because it, it isn't yours to do that with, okay? Second problem with it is the generative AI models lie when you ask them that type of question because they 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 honestly don't know um, and, I know I'm giving them sentience here that they don't have, but it's it's easier to talk about them in that way. Um, they, they don't know. So they just guess and say, oh, yes, this looks like something that could have been written by a generative AI. Or they'll say, no, I have no recollection of writing this. There is no reliability in either of those statements. So trying to use those tools to do that is really, really flawed. And I'm also going to talk about in a moment, well, in the next section along so in, in about probably 50 minutes about why we turn the detector off or some of the reasons why we turn the detector off and why we really need to move away from this idea that it's possible to detect when something's been written by generative ai or not okay. right i can see there's little bubbles which i think mean people are typing but i'll move on and then we could i can always come back to this at the end if we've got time so, as I said, in CIE, we are really all for getting opinions on what we do and making sure that it's the best that it can be. Um, and in terms of the generative AI, we really felt, you know, we'd, we'd created this guidance, we'd, we'd, we'd changed the policy in these ways, and we had no idea if it was going to work or not. We, we, we did the best that we could, but, but there was very little research or literature at the time to say what worked, what didn't. We just had to do what we thought was best for our institution. And then we actually wanted to ask the staff and students, did this work? Did this work for you? How did you find that first semester? So we ran a survey um, between January and March uh, of this year, one for staff and a separate one for students, asking them several questions about their use of generative AI, but also about the, the policy that the university were using or the policy and the guidance the university were using to try and help people use generative AI productively. <clears throat> so I'll talk to the staff results first, and then I'll, I'll come on to the students. So when it came to the staff, um, bit of a bit, bit of a, not necessarily a wake up call for us on these ones, but it kind of confirmed some of our fears about it. So when it came to the policy, so the academic integrity policy, 31% um, found that the changes to that had been useful and had helped them um, decide whether academic misconduct had occurred in terms of generative AI. However, 35% didn't find it useful at all. And then another um, sort of third of the, the respondents were either unaware that we changed the policy or unaware that the academic integrity policy actually related to generative AI at all, okay? And then in terms of the guidance, 39% um, found it useful, which which was good that, you know, it had been used to, to some people. However, we have 49% explicitly stating that they did not find the guidance useful um, and 12% were unsure either way. Um, I will come back to that, that, that not usefulness in a moment because I've got some quotes from staff and I think that really helps us highlight why people were finding it useful. But if anyone wants to express an opinion on either of those in terms of why you did or did not find it useful, please add them to the Padlet and we can add it to, to the rest of the date we've got to try and help us make those documents um, more useful to, to the users. In terms of the actual acceptable and unacceptable uses we described in the documents, we were interested to see if staff actually agreed with those um, and, and were, were kind of building them into their courses and explaining them to students. So we asked staff for each of the ones that were listed in the document if they agreed with it or not. Okay. So just to explain the numbers on the slide here. So these are all the acceptable uses that we have listed in that guidance document. This is the number of people who responded to that question. So they said, yep, yeah, that is a acceptable use. So they kind of tick the box that says, yes, that's acceptable. 
the percentage is the number of people who answered any option on this question. Okay, so um, for all the people who answered any one of these, 48% of them thought that background research was an acceptable use. However, not everyone who completed the survey um, ticked anything, and, and that could be because they thought none of them were acceptable. So we have also included this um, statistic here at the end as well. So that's out of all respondents to the survey. So out of all respondents to the survey, 33% of them thought that background research um, was acceptable. So you can see that the um, most acceptable use here, um, according to staff, was formatting a reference list. And I, and I think that's fairly, yep, yeah, everyone can agree with that. Um, it's something that we've been sort of outsourcing to automatic tools for a long, long time. You know, how long has EndNote been around? Integrated tools in, in Word now. We've been quite happy for a very long time to leave format of your formatting of references to a machine. We all appreciate it's a very time consuming, very boring, not very, you know, you're not learning anything from formatting references in, in the 12th different type of referencing format you've been asked to use. Okay, so something like that, no one seems to have a problem with, you know, pushing that over to, to something automated. The interesting answers for this really came for when we asked when we compare this to when we asked about the unacceptable uses that we'd put into the guidance document. So again, this table shows exactly the same numbers this time, but this time we're looking at the unacceptable uses of generative AI that, that we described, and they're all listed down here, okay? First thing to know is the obvious increase in the number of people answering this question compared to the prior, okay? So these are both you know, one question after another. There is no reason that someone would have skipped the first one and then answered the second one unless they really felt that Gen AI is not acceptable. So we're seeing a much higher count of individuals saying that yeah, generative AI is, is not acceptable for most reasons. So the top one, is very, very obvious. Students passing off generative or AI generated work as their own. Okay, nobody thought that was acceptable. And also everybody who answered the question ticked that and said, yes, that is an unacceptable use of generative AI, as you would expect. And we get a high uh, agreement with all of them, almost 100% on every single one, every single um, use case we have in our guidance as unacceptable is universally considered unacceptable by our staff, okay? Which is re really reassuring that there wasn't anything in there that anyone thought, oh no, we should be getting students to do that, okay? So what's clear to us then is that we have a really good understanding of what we don't want students to do with it. However, the gray areas and the difficulty comes when we're trying to write the guidance around what we should be allowing students to do with it. And I think that's really coming from this context dependence that I spoke about before, okay? Because it really, really does depend on what you're assessing your students on, not even like across your course, but on one specific assessment. On one specific assessment, it may or may not be appropriate for your students to be using generative AI to organize the work. If a key learning outcome for that assessment is for students to learn how to organize something in a specific way, they've passed that learning onto the machine and it's not appropriate. However, in other cases, that's not what you're assessing at all. You're assessing something really technical and, and you know, specific and you just need it organized nicely so you can read it and, and it makes it easier to mark. In that case, who cares if they've used generative AI to help them organize it? And that context dependent, as I've said, makes the guidance really difficult to make centrally. Um, but coming on to just the last bit of, of uh, details from the staff. So I've got some quotes here from, from the free text uh, boxes that were available. And these are kind of some of the responses that we're getting. And I've kind of picked these ones out because they, they kind of highlight the four main big themes that, we, that we're taking from it as things that we need to work on. Um, so the, people found that the, change, the actual change to the policy, the COPA, no problems with that. It, it made sense. It was then how the guidance linked to the COPA. Okay, so how does that 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 acceptable unacceptable then link to um, academic misconduct? And I think that was the bit that really um, struggled with, because as I uh, come to my second one, the policy didn't really explicitly include instructions on how to enforce it. So staff were unsure if they suspected generative AI use, how to, to go about enforcing that. And hopefully the, the new guidance that we've put out on that may help, but I think it's still a very difficult, difficult area. 
Um, another big thing is that workloads aren't allowing people to prioritize engagement with this. Um, I've been speaking to academics uh, over the past few weeks on, on several um, Gen AI projects that we're running, and they're saying that, it, you know, this it's finding the time. They really want to learn more. They really want to get engaged with the tools, but they're just struggling to find the time and to prioritize it over their ever expanding um, list of things to do. And uh, compounding that is what's perceived as poorly managed communication. Um, and, and yeah, communicating something centrally and getting it out to everybody who actually needs to read it is extremely difficult. And, and highlighting it in such a way of like, you need to read this sort of way when it doesn't get lost in emails or Teams notifications or an endless list of meetings. It's really, really, really difficult. Um, and if anyone's got an answer to a communication over a large institution like this, please come see us in CIE. We would, we would love to hear some ideas around that. Okay. Okay. I'm just sorry. I'm just taking a moment. I've just spotted something in the chat. I love she. Yeah. So Bryony. Hi, Brainy. Um, is just mentioning about um, so the referencing. So although yeah, you might use ChatGPT, that um. EndNote is still the best <laughs> referencing tool out there. And I definitely agree. And it is true. It's, it's getting students to appreciate that, yes, they could use Gen AI or, um, you know, one of the tools to do it for them, but there are sometimes better tools for it. So, you know, kind of taking their initial um, reactions, oh, I could just Gen AI that to say, oh, how about this? How about using this slightly better tool that's going to do it in a better way? Definitely. Okay, so that's what the staff thought. Moving on to uh, the students. Okay, so the first thing we asked the students were, uh, were they aware that we had guidance relating to generative AI use? Um, and the majority said yes. So, you know, over 60% said, yes, I'm aware we've got guidance. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, you know, only 40% had actually read it, but you know, that's, that's still a significant minority of students uh, aware we have guidance on it and they've taken the time to actually read it. The remainder of the yeses um, are kind of, yes, I, I know it's there and I kind of know what it says because I've spoken to my friends, but no, I've not read it. <laughs> okay, which is a nice honesty from them that they're, they're admitting that although they know it's there, they haven't actually read it. Um, then we've got the no's. So there's the no's who are kind of, mm, no, I wasn't really aware, but I'm guessing I could guess what it contained. And then the no's of, oh, no, I, I wasn't aware and I have no intention of engaging with that. Um, but then worryingly, the bottom one, the, the no's, then I, I wouldn't know where to find it, even if I wanted to look at it. Okay, so the this is the more concerning one at the bottom here, because this is students that could maybe benefit or be more engaged with the guidance if they only knew where to find it. So yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one again, coming around communication with students and especially new students, they're gonna get bombarded with a lot of information at the start and trying to direct them to the, the most pertinent. It is difficult for us as a central team. So it's something that maybe um, teaching teams can think about in, in part of the, your induction. I'm sure most of you do it anyway. In terms of your induction, in terms of your expectations on students, you kind of communicate in uh, generative AI expectations around that as well. And I know speaking to, to many academics, it is now becoming sort of part of your the induction package is that there's this generative AI um, on there as well and bringing in obviously the tools from the library. So the know-how team have created some great student facing resources around um, generative AIs for students and, and they're really useful um, and that builds on their work um, working with directly with students and surveying students so, so Brian and Heather uh, published a, a study last year looking at you know how many students were using generative AI and what they're using for and then they're doing a much more detailed session this the, the detailed study right now that they presented on Monday. So if anyone didn't catch Brian and Heather's session on Monday, I do recommend looking at that recording on exactly what students are using it for when they try and approach an assessment task. It was a, it was a really good talk and I found it really interesting. But coming back to, to policy, um, you, you have to keep coming back to that. So this is, yeah, the, are they aware of it? The majority are, but, but we could do better. Um, Moving on to that acceptable and unacceptable usage. So I've, I've kind of 
done it slightly differently for the students because for the students we just took each statement and asked them to to take whether they thought they were either uh, acceptable or unacceptable and then I rated these so to the most acceptable to least acceptable according to, to faculty so essentially on this diagram the points near the middle are things that students find acceptable and the points around the edge are things that they find unacceptable so really obvious ones so using generative ai in a way that conflicts their context guidance so this would be a specific assessment instruction submitting work without citation submitting gen ai text, gen AI text as their own they know that these things are are unacceptable but equally you know they think it should be acceptable to to use it for summarizing text for note taking in a group discussion for organizing their work um, and then we start getting up to the gray area so something like background research uh, quoting gen AI text for a specific purpose uh, translating work it becomes a bit grayer one that I found interesting that moves into this gray area is the formatting a reference list considering that staff generally think that that's absolutely fine students are a bit more like oh no I shouldn't be doing that and, I, and we kind of wondered and reflected on whether that's because we kind of as academics especially for first years talk a lot about how important format the references are and often their initial assignments they can lose marks because of their reference formatting so they, they might really view it as this really key skill that they have to learn how to do when actually it's no you need to learn how to use a tool that's going to do it well for you so maybe a little bit to learn from that one um, and then final um, slide when it comes to the, the student um, results is again just a couple of quotes and then um, we also asked them how confident they were on how confident they felt in either not or using generative AI in their assessments and I think here it, it's quite obvious that students are not feeling confident in terms of whether they are, can or cannot use generative AI some some are feeling very very confident um, some some but there's a lot that's unsure and then some that are definitely you know unconfident ab about their ability to use it and that's kind of summarising that first quote there, saying I'm unclear to what extent I, I can use it. Um, they've been asking it for ideas, but they're not sure if that's all right or not. And then the second quote um, I found interesting because they're saying some staff are prohibiting it and be very clear that we're not allowed to use it, but most don't mention it. Okay, and I think that is coming into a, a fundamental problem that we have is, well, when this study was done anyway, I think this has changed in the past six months, is that people weren't talking about it enough. People were thinking, oh, if I don't talk about it, they won't use it and the problem will go away. And I think everyone's realised that that's not the case, that you need to be quite explicit with it about your students and talk to your students about it. Um, but then on the end of this quote, I did like that they, you know, they'd have a go, they'd had a go with it and had a play with it. And it's been fairly useless. And that came across on quite a few comments we got from the students is that they saw how unreliable it was when they tried to use it for tasks. Um, and I think if they'd put persisted with it a bit more and maybe had a bit more training on prompt literacy they they could have got better but it's kind of reassuring that if that that first sort of novice attempt in it and if it gives them something that's garbage they just think oh this tool is garbage they they don't necessarily have the perseverance to go oh if maybe if i ask it something different maybe if i probe it a bit more i'm saying you know this this is a small selection of students it doesn't cover our entire student population but there is sort of that feeling out there Okay, so overall, where did oops, sorry, where did all of that leave us? Okay, and essentially with with work to do, we are we are nowhere near the the end of this process yet, in terms of fully understanding how we can help both staff and students navigate um, assessment and teaching contexts in this world that we live in with um, access to generative AI. So. It's the, the kind of take home headlines that, that I've certainly got from the survey is that staff are finding um, the way we've approached it at the moment too difficult to navigate pragmatically. Um, and students are a bit unsure of where they stand in terms of if they can or cannot use generative AI, which, which is not great. OK, we need to improve both those things. But linked to that is my next fundamental question, which is which is again one that's on the Padlet. It is and I'd love to hear people's opinion on this, on whether you think it is actually possible to police generative AI use. And by that, I kind of mean, is it possible to either catch or stop students from using Gen AI? 
And I'll just bring up the Padlet on the screen again. Okay, a lot of it depends so far on that one. Okay, I, I cannot tell you how reassured I am by those responses <laughs> because I, I feel exactly the same. I, if anything, I tend more towards the, the no. I, I just do not think it's possible to police generative AI usage. Um, the tools themselves are becoming more and more sophisticated and things that used to be able to catch them out um, six months, a year ago, won't work now. So for example, one of the classics that the people said is, oh, look for the fake references or look for the references that, that you know, if you do your similarity, so your similarity report and turn it in, if you get a reference that isn't similar at all, has never been cited anywhere ever, then that's very suspicious because it's clearly made up. Um, but ChatGPT especially has got better at this now. It now uses real references that have links that work and you can go and find those references. Whether those references say what it said it said is a different matter, but the references themselves are now actually real. Um, and the language it uses is getting um, more sophisticated, less predictable. Um, you can easily ask it to rephrase things and make things sound better. And students can always just take that, that basic, you know, paragraph, two paragraphs that ChatGPT makes and then edit it in very small ways, and suddenly it doesn't like look like anything like something that a, an AI model would would have written. So policing is getting more and more more difficult. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm hoping your name isn't actually Chubby Cricket, but I agree, Chubby Cricket, that it would be the same as trying to police Google use, and this it 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 feels to me a very similar sort of step. In, in terms of, of education. So uh, I, I when I was at university, the big thing that came out was Wikipedia and um, everyone was like, oh my gosh, this is gonna change everything. Like students can just, you know, Google search it and there's the answer. And, and in the end, it all calmed down. And it wasn't that bad because Wikipedia wasn't that reliable and it got better and everything worked out. With generative AI, I think it is a bigger step than that. And it is more concerning uh, than, than when Wikipedia came out, but it isn't so, when Google came out, we kind of embraced it and we've moved on now. We're, and we're at the point now where we would never dream of saying to students, you can't use Google to help you search for things. You have to go to the library and use the card index. It, it, you would never dream of saying that. And it is moving in that way of saying, we can't really tell students to not use ChatGPT because they're going to use it anyway. What we have to get them to do is use it in the right way. OK, we we can show them what it's bad at, what it's really bad at. We can show them what it's better at. But we also need to show them that tasks where if they get ChatGP to do it for them, they're not going to learn. And if they don't learn and they get out of uni with their certificate on the end, what are they what's the consequences going to be for them long term? Essentially, they're going to be blagging it for the rest of their life you know, in a very unsecure position because they haven't got the knowledge that they need to actually do whatever it is they've come to university to learn how to do. Okay. It's a hard, it's a hard philosophical fight, but it, it's there that they're here to learn and we need to make sure that they're focusing on the learning, not getting tasks done, which can be the, the problem. Um, the Rachel's made the point that you can if it's a small cohort. Yeah, I agree with that. When If you can have the opportunity to have a small cohort and get to know your students, you could definitely. Um, yeah. So yeah, when you've got this small cohort where you know their actual levels because you interact with them all the time and then suddenly this piece of work comes in that is way above, it is much harder, much easier, sorry, to spot. But I think as most people um, experience in higher education at the moment, it's all about increasing those class sizes you know, more and more students, more and more money. Um, and, and with that system, that, that um, increasing participation system of getting as many people to university as we can, then yeah, policing generative AI on that sort of level of, of knowing people would just require a lot more staff. And if that's the solution to generative AI, I'm all, I'm all for that, but then I don't hold the purse strings. So it's unlikely to happen. But if we, if we could get the staff student ratio right, possibly, yeah, I agree with that. Okay, I've just spotted the time. It's really flying away with me. So I'm going to move on. Um, 
So I'm glad I'm glad we're, we're in agreement about that policing um, because it makes this this next bit about why we turn the detector off a, a bit easier to, to talk about. So these are, aren't really official reasons. They're sort of kind of the, the my my understanding of some of the reasons why we turned it off. So the big one is that it wasn't detecting anything. It wasn't a detector. It was a predictor. It predicted when text had been written by generative AI. It did not detect anything. It wasn't proof of anything. It was just a clue. And those clues that it left were unreliable. So sometimes it missed really obvious generative AI text. And by obvious, I mean, sometimes you read text and it's got those three part sentences in and it uses words that only ChatGPT seems to like. And you're like, this really looks like it's been written by AI, but it wasn't picked up. Um, but it also falsely identified innocent students who who just who had just written in a more sort of structured way, um, trying to sort of write either in a what they considered an academic writing style, um, getting picked up. And lastly, it increased the number of academic misconduct investigations. And I don't think there's a department we've spoken to who who said that they're you know they're academic investigations didn't go through the roof last year because of this detector score and people feeling they had to react or had to action somehow this detector score. Um, but actually that's not actually led to any more convictions of students. Um, you know, th that is um, anecdotal. I don't have any written proof of that, but just speaking to people, they've said, no, actually, you know, it, it's led to the investigation, but there's not enough proof. It's all fallen through and we've not led to, to any more convictions. So the question is, right, what do we do now? OK, we, we've we've established that um, the, you know, the academic integrity policy, it, it works at what we need it to do. We've got guidance on it that, that people we need to work on because it is it, not not working quite right. And I loved this quote I got in a workshop um, earlier this year when we were looking at generative AI and the way forward. And this academic said, I've realized I can't retire quickly enough to ignore this. <laughs> and it really struck a chord with me. And it, it kind of felt that, that people maybe had been approaching it in that way of like, oh, if I just ignore this, it might go away. Oh, if I just pretend it doesn't exist for another semester, I'll deal with it next semester. And it, it's finally hit that crunch point where people are like, no, I, I, we need to do something about this. What are we actually going to do? Okay. And what, I'm going to propose today and what kind of we're trying to push through CIE and the team that I'm working with is that the way forward with all of this won't necessarily be through policy and policing. OK, so we've kind of talked about the fact that um, we can't really police this use very well in, in a mass education system. Um, and the policy itself at the moment people have said it's fine it's the guidance that's the issue so if the policy is okay we can't really change that you know we can't make it any different to what it is it says that inappropriate use of generative ai is academic misconduct what what what, what else can can we possibly say other than that so I've, I've mentioned this a few times now that it's that context of the individual assessment is, is the key thing that, that's making the guidance more difficult for us to, to write in, in a more specific way or a more detailed way. So another example is sort of paraphrasing. So paraphrasing um, your, your own work. So if you've written something, you're like, oh, I wish I could write that better or, or more succinctly, would that be okay or not? And it depends on whether that's a learning outcome of the assessment. If one of the learning outcomes of your assessment is to write well in an academic style in English, then absolutely needs to be you doing it. However, often assessments aren't really looking at that. Assessors, what they're really testing is their technical understanding of a subject and their, their knowledge of that subject and how well it's written, you know, if they've had some assistance with that, it's less of a priority. OK, so it's up to those teams to make that decision. And it all comes down to the fact that assessors now to be need to be thinking really specifically about what they can and cannot assess through the coursework method, knowing that um, access to generative AI is ubiquitous and any student can, can log on to, to chat GPT and use it to help them with their coursework assessments, whether we say they can or can't it's irrelevant, they can do it. So if they did do it, can they show you they've learned? And that's the key thing, okay? Will the assessment show that they've learned something? And when we've been speaking to staff, um, 
uh, about this. The, the investigations into the academic misconduct have taken up a huge amount of time. And when I start talking about the way forward and bringing up this idea of assessment redesign, I'm like, oh, Claire, but that's going to be so much work. And I agree, it is going to be a lot of work. But it comes down to the fact that we either put the work in at the assessment redesign stage and really concentrate on what you're assessing and how you can get students to do what you need them to do to show you that they've learned, or you do the work at the end trying to catch them um, of using ChatGPT inappropriately. OK, and from the conversations I've had, people do appreciate that the assessment redesign would be a better use of their time than trying to chase people at the end. OK, so if you could put the work in at the start, it might limit the work in the future or reduce the work in the future. And this brings us nicely onto some assessment redesign principles and potential strategies that I'm not going to go into detail at all because there is a fabulous session happening at two o'clock today um, run by Sam and Rob. So um, I'll leave those guys to go into all the details for you. But these are just kind of some basics that, that we talk to staff uh, about. So assessing process, not product, which is not a, not a simple thing to do. Um, but inclusion of generative AI deeply within your assessments, so students are engaging with it all the way through. Um, including things around generative AI in your marking criteria, um, making use of multimodality and using output as part of the assessment itself are all different strategies we can use to, to help uh, mitigate this misuse later on. The other thing that we're doing at the moment is a Think Aloud study. Um, so this is um, being led by Caroline Hans in the psychology department, but with big involvement from, from us in CIE, where we're working one-on-one -on -one with academics to go through one of their assessments um, and put it through ChatGPT. So we take the assessment brief, um, pretend to be a student, put it in ChatGPT as if we were going to get ChatGPT to do the work for us, look at the output, and then the academics are just talking through their reactions to that. And what we found is that sometimes it is sort of like, oh, oh my gosh, that's, that's really good. Um, this is something that my students would write and I would pass this. And then we've started to probe, okay, why why is that happening? What is it about this that makes it a good assessment? And then from that, we can start to thinking about redesigning the assessment in ways that means that ChatGPT will get worse at it and maybe their students will get better. In other instances, it's been really nice to see academic surprise that ChatGPT can't do their assessment. So I was looking at one earlier this week. Um, where initially the, the academic was quite impressed. She was like, oh, well, that's a good structure. And, other, and then she started to read it and she was like, actually, this has no detail at all. And it's missing a lot of the key things we'd expect. And it, and it shows this was a practical subject and it showed that the student had, or the writing had no links to practice. It was very theoretical, very vague, and actually meant that she then felt confident in her assessment because she realized, what the system can't do right now. And I think it's going to become an important part of that assessment design process almost every year that you're running your assessments through uh, the, the coursework assessments through ChatGPT to see what stage it's at and see what, what it could produce. OK. So last real slide for me today is I'm going to finish with the question um, of the whole cold talk of is it possible to, to make a Gen AI academic policy that is fit for purpose? And by that, I mean, lead us to a world where we know students are using generative AI in productive ways. Um, and it's the last uh, question on the, the Padlet. Um, as I said, the Padlet will be open and left. So if there's anything after the session uh, you want to add in there, uh, please do. Uh, please leave loads and loads of comments. Um, I, I love hearing about how people are using generative AI or the concerns about it or what they want from us at CIE to help them with it. It's, it's all useful stuff for us. Um, but if you want to contact us as directly, there's a CIE email, email me directly as well. Um, Sam and Rob, they're other key workers on generative AI, but we all have to be involved in it because it's it's a, a, a lot of, of, of what's going on right now and a lot of people's concerns and and thinking about how to, to approach it going forward. Um, so thank you everyone for putting up with an hour on um, policy talk. I hope it wasn't too much policy and, and was enough interesting things for you. And just before we finish up, I'll just go back to the Padlet. Um, I just want to see what the results of that final one were. Okay. <laughs> so a lot of yeses, a lot of yeses and um, a few it depends as well. But yeah, 
yeah, I agree that it, th there should be there should be somewhere where we can make it clear to students what we want them to do. But equally, there's a lot of other considerations. So yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks, Claire. That was brilliant. Clear, calm and concise. I think you've done really well there with the, the topic at hand and great to see the engagement on the Padlet. We're right at the end of the session. So if there is a sort of final question, pop it in the chat. But I think everyone's just sort of saying thank you for that. You know, everyone stayed in the entire duration. So that's always a, a good measure. And there's a point on the Padlet from Ruby about professional services staff and getting guidelines built for them. So yeah, that's something that perhaps we can look at supporting and, and maybe getting yeah. some of that team in at some point and seeing how we do it. But no, really clear. Yeah, loved it. And I will put the recording and slides up on the Padlet. So thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Great. And I will just end this meeting, Claire. Actually, you have to end it. You have the power. So I will leave. And when you end it, we all end. So thank you very <laughs> much. See you later.